Yes, welcome back. I'm feeling here like I have a heavy armory on my right hand. So there are former states ministers, uh, for heads of foreign intelligence service and current technology as advisors to government, all the central bankers and, uh, and world institutes together discussing this. So I'm really shaking. So let's find out how they feel about the uh, situation, because I have to admit the problem is also difficult. So I will start with Raiva Vara, because Raiva, you didn't get to say any longer story, but uh, for you is, it must be a kind of deja vu if we discuss rebuilding Ukraine, because you have been Estonian first states minister during the 1990 till 92, and later on you have been working uh, in uh, roads and communications, you have been minister, but also always, as far as I remember your presentations everywhere, you have been so interested in logistics, energy, infrastructure, all these kind of things. So um, how did you feel about all these discussions, what, what are your first thoughts about this? With whom you want to argue or where you see the greatest weaknesses of our discussions? Well, uh, I do not see weaknesses. Uh, I, I foresee some problems for sure. Yep. First and foremost is the issue of the ref continuous reforming, which is still needed in Ukraine. And uh, there is a, unfortunately, I have also a kind of uh, Understanding that at least partly in the society in Ukraine is governing point of view is that uh, it's not the time for reforms because we have hardship of war. Mm -hmm. And I'm totally opposing this logic. And it's uh, coming both from theory and from personal experience as well that it should be done exactly when it's hard. Then a lot of things can be done which otherwise wouldn't be done for many, many reasons. It's typical for democratic countries especially. First point. Second point is about the, the attacks which Russians are uh, exercising now on, uh, on critical infrastructure. For obvious political reasons which have been touched already, but if you look from the perspective of economy, the problem is that without the critical infrastructure in place, at least to a certain level working without harm, it's very difficult to move forward in proper spe speed. Mm -hmm. Third point, it's about Marshall Plan. Well, nobody remembers that along with Marshall Plan, there was a Morgenthau Plan. Mm -hmm. And those who know, understands my hint. So th that's the point. For Ukraine, it has been Morgenthau Plan, plan uh, at place for a while, speaking frankly. Mm -hmm. I'm critical now. But mm -hmm. when we're talking about Marshall Plan, we have also problems. We have problems of execution for Marshall Plan in, with the participation on a Western, with Western partners, in case that the con uh, conflict will continue, like Reiner described it, possibly as a low-key, maybe even, but still military uh, standoff, it's almost impossible to imagine that the involvement of Western partners will be sufficient enough for martial execution. So this is a major concern of mine because it's embedded into the Western way of thinking and doing things. And Russians know that and they try to sabotage it by all means, whether we like it or not. And we've seen it again, not on such a magnitude, of course, but we've seen it in the beginning of 90s. So we have to count it in automatically in our risk assessment of further development and restoration of Ukrainian power, which is there generally. We need to count in that Russians will sabotage it even after they uh, achieve something on, on the field of diplomatic arrangements. They will still continue to do it. Yes, I agree with that. And before I let uh, everybody to answer to these uh, things, I know that Janika has to leave earlier. So she's the advisor of a government in war. So we can forgive her for that. But I wanted to ask her before she leaves, that uh, especially coming from your first comment is that uh, Ukraine should reform while it is the hardest. And uh, of course, we have done it too here in Estonia. And maybe one can say that we are now too slow or too convenient, comfortable even. So you can describe a little bit how Ukrainian government works now. And, and uh, uh, you hint pointed uh, that maybe we could 
learn from the e-procurement system. But do you see anything else we can learn here in the peaceful, calm, rich Estonia, only maybe complaining too much? But, you know, because uh, if you look at, we, we also know that uh, you are moving from mining to technology, similar problems we have in our eastern part. So you also have space industry traditions in, uh, in, in Ukraine. Uh, perhaps you also... Uh, can teach us about nuclear energy. You know, how do you see that? You know, what we could learn? Yes, unfortunately, I'm not a nuclear scientist, but I'll try. <clears throat> so, yes, of course, the Ukraine should reform in time of war. And I think actually IT and technology sector has shown it uh, with uh, being total out of box, <coughs> meaning that it has done so well because there has been no box, because young people, young ministers, like 25, 26 years old, come to government and when someone is saying, like, it has always been like that, like what? I haven't been around for that long time. So <laughs> so basically, it's very like, let's say, uh, in certain areas, reform-oriented, in certain uh, areas, it's still um, government, uh, parliament, which is still influenced by oligarchs uh, who have their interests. It has gone, it hasn't changed. Yes, there is a war, but there are still in interests and different interests and so on. So it's a very, very hard struggle that we were lucky that Estonia, the oligarchy wasn't born basically when you have it already. And it's like controlling certain areas and certain flows and certain cash flows and certain uh, like institutions of power. It's very hard to fight then. But yes, Estonia is uh, very comfortable, very kind of relaxed, uh, riding on the tiger uh, like for the last 20 years. For five years, uh, let's say, so many more things could have been done. And thank you for Lucas Silvas, actually, who invited me to Ministry of Economy to uh, to share the lessons learned from Ukraine. So basically, one of my things or lessons learned, I think, from Ukraine was uh, what Let's hope it will never happen, but what if in Estonia the same scenario would happen? Would we be ready? And in technology, we definitely wouldn't be ready, which means we cannot even uh, uh, store our information in clouds. Basically, we have data centers somewhere which will be bombed, as they say, so from uh, Ukraine. Uh, our cybersecurity, yes, we think that we are very good, but we have certain loopholes, and we can see that. Our procurement system, would we be able to procure everything that is needed very fast, very transparently, and so on, very efficiently? Uh, the e-services, I don't have my government on smartphone. I should be looking for a computer and for my ID card or my mobile ID or so on. So we're definitely not ready, and I think we have many lessons learned, especially in this kind of uh, digital uh, world where we think that we are the best in the world in Estonia, but so many lessons that we could learn. So, ouch, this was, this was painful. Thank you, Janika, uh, for that. So, uh, I have now, I have to come back to Raiva's points because these are really crucial. Like, uh, the first was the infrastructure and the second one was about the political will to give that economic support later on when, when it's really necessary. And here, you know, uh, do you want to comment, like anyone, P uh, Peter, for example, you were very optimistic yeah. about that. What yeah. do you think about that? Well, indeed, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, there is a reason for optimist, because if I look on the financial side, then everything is doable on the presumption that uh, the military and security issues are solved by others. Uh, but, uh, but basically, um, what is quite important is that uh, it's not only about what kind of aid and how much to aid to provide Ukraine, but also what kind of aid to, to, to resist and to receive. And uh, here, are, here is quite, it is very likely that, for example, China will come uh, with less conditionality, perhaps conditions will come later. It's also quite possible that at least to some uh, segments of society, the good is just good as, as the old one was in terms of corruption and, and stuff like that. So the, the only thing which we should definitely avoid is to, to, to repeat the same cycle again mm -hmm. in this regard. And it also means that uh, foreign aid providers not only should coordinate what kind of aid to provide, but also to advise um, Ukraines what kind of uh, perhaps easy money not to receive. And then this is something which uh, obviously uh, is uh, very challenging, especially at the times when there is a prolonged conflict. Uh, there is no any kind of clear visibility of, of uh, simple uh, military solutions. And, uh, and in this regard, it's, uh, I would say that the only 
let's put it this way, interim step would be that to get the EU uh, accept Ukraine as soon as possible. As soon as possible is not tomorrow, obviously, but it takes time. And this integration process is already running in parallel. And when, um, when Ukraine is in, uh, in the EU, then basically um, it's very easy to replicate the, the success story of Poland and some other countries. Even I would say that in population-wise, Poland and uh, Ukraine are the biggest Eastern EU countries. And it means that uh, if Poland was able to almost double its uh, income per head within 15 years' time, then why, why Ukraine cannot do it, even considering that the initial levels are lower. So this is something which has already been practiced, and it works. Uh, un unless there is a kind of other scenario when basically there is a kind of uh, uh, fatigue of helping Ukraine, and there is unclear vision what is going to happen militarily, and then basically easy money will come and flow in, and with conditions which are revealed later on. And this is something which is worth to be av avoided. Mm -hmm. Just, wanted uh, to go I think from historical experience of my own, uh, speaking frankly, the, 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 the way of doing things as required to get in to the very club, let's put it in such a way, it's very important to do it. It's, it's very often people tend to, uh, because of uh, legacy issues, because of the unpreparedness to accept it, people tend to think that, okay, let's, let's uh, cut the corner, this and that, and, you know, not doing exactly like this. And it seems that nothing happens very much right now or right away. Mm -hmm. But sooner or later, it accumulates into something which becomes a kind of obstacle. And these things are not accidentally put into all kinds of a keys for entrance. Basically, it's about doing things right. And it's very important that Ukraine, despite of all the hardship they, they are facing right now, they take this attitude, not cutting corners, going along by all means. And the, even if it takes time, mm -hmm. it's for good. Mm -hmm. Okay, Rainer, you wanted to comment. Yep, That's, I agree totally that uh, too much hate can kill the patient. It's like uh, absolutely something which cannot happen and has been happening several times, I have yeah. seen it. And uh, both sides have to be very smart. It's, uh, it's classical. But, but I would like to underline one, one very important moment here is that Ukrainian people or nation have, have demonstrated that they are very unique one. That they are really fighting back in a, quite in a desperate situation. Started in 2014. Usually everybody forgets about it. it and even 2014 was not the starting point. It was 2004 already we demonstrated their will actually to stand for uh, freedom, for, for, um, let's say, whatever, democracy, free society, let's say, political freedom and free society. And that explains a little bit the paradox, like how was it possible to see that in, in one country the very strong civil society is existing in parallel with, uh, let's say, corruption. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, here is something that uh, this kind of a spirit is, uh, which is very, very special element in this game. And I will not list any nations who are, we, you, you can say, just take a look at, yeah, we can do the same. But we see that Ukrainians are doing this and uh, some of our neighbors are not doing this at all. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's one of the issues, which means they have a chance to get rid of their legacy at the moment. So where is the spirit to do it? So, but it's very much dependent on the leadership who can find this path. It's to, just to guide this motivation on a, on, a, on a right direction. And this is very, very important moment, as I mentioned already, that uh, to get out of a military conflict is psychologically very, very hard moment. Mm -hmm. So it's something we, we should support if we can. I don't yeah. know, can we? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And Janika, you wanted to mention? No, just a small comment to that, that uh, Ukrainians are extremely stubborn. When something doesn't work, they reboot it, basically. The government, every time it's like, whether it's Orange Revolution or it's election of new president or so on. Second it, Maidan, yeah. Yes, yeah. Second Maidan and so on. It's not like, okay, let's wait, maybe it will change. It's like, no, let's rebel, let's mm -hmm. change. If it doesn't work, let's change again. <laughs> Yeah. Perhaps we have not too much to lose in the terms of like personal fortune or something like in usually, you know, let's say old fashioned societies, it's, it's going in a way. But yeah, but there are some other explanations as well. It doesn't just be only one.
Yes. So this is actually very interesting. You are coming closer to economists. So the pol political discussion is, of course, very interesting. But uh, doing practically something. When, uh, Peter, you said clearly that EU should drive this uh, and coordinate. Mm -hmm. When I... and. I have read so many papers where they say that, uh, especially in the United States, that the Ukraine should coordinate the need and, uh, and, uh, and all this international aid. So if I hear about coordination between international organization, as economists, I've kind of heard the stories of some, let's not say, some governments who were struggling with IMF and World Bank and all these uh, helping out uh, officials that they didn't have in the ministries time to, you know, really do their job because they were uh, all the time communicating with these uh, uh, international um, uh, people, officials who tried to help them. So how do you see in practice this coordination? Because we have been arguing, should we start now or not now, but obviously later, because now we, we are in war. But, uh, and, and also, who should take a lead and how in practice this lead could be you know, uh, uh, taken? So how we can manage if we are not good in coordinating things? You know? Well, uh, we had a financial crisis, a good practice, actually. And uh, regarding European debt crisis, there was a coordination. And, and it also proved that uh, even to cooperate in between such institutions like perhaps Central Bank Commission and why not IMF, it was doable during the crisis regime. And one of the things which was quite important in, in those institutions was not necessarily to provide direct any kind of very significant financial aid, but to be a kind of bad cop in the game. So, so if country w was in the position to accept the program, then uh, for local politicians it was very difficult to sell unpopular decisions unless they gave as a kind of conditionality for, for some financial aid. And this was also something which uh, enabled to some extent to gain this local ownership and preserve, let's put it this way, power for those who were responsible for running the country. So sometimes this external pressure uh, can drive and sometimes skip the populist discussions about whether we should do it or not do mm -hmm. things or re-elect some governments. And, and I think it's uh, precisely the thing why this external pressure is necessary. And even uh, the powers of Ukraine, they have told that uh, Ukrainians will have in those organizations or this help organization most likely a share, but most likely a quarter or something, not more in terms of uh, decision making power. Because they accept the fact that um, the external pressure is sometimes under the crisis regime, when it's friendly, it's quite useful. Okay. Mm -hmm. you want I, I would say? just be very brief that. Uh, mm. I, I think that the Russia will be a bigger challenge for uh, for the international community in Ukraine if a, if a crisis ends, and uh, and it's not so easy to say that it's just you, you should create kind of a somebody will take care about the Ukraine just only and will deal with this issue. It's it's more complex, is one thing. But I think it's, uh, the security comes first, uh, like Rai was said already in in this corridor that if uh, if uh, security of Ukraine is not guaranteed, it's impossible to solve all other things. You can start with humanitarian aid or, or some very, very necessary, short, limited term kind of a programs. But if you like to go for the Marshall plans, then the security is kind of a cornerstone of that program. So it's perhaps finally it will be some kind of a mixed body between Ukrainians, EU or somebody who has the money. <laughs> but, uh, mm -hmm. but we can't predicted before we have seen that the security issue sold. And I'm not talking that Ukraine will become a member, member of a NATO necessarily. There are some other options as well, mm -hmm. but it uh, can be United Nations based, but it should be military backed, militarily backed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, uh, just please. Uh, yeah, brief please. Thing. There should be an owner of the project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And owner of the project should be uh, on different levels. Definitely it's nation as such desiring to go to there, yeah. to get there, yeah. to do it. But on top of that, you need just a practical ownership. And right from the toppest layer of the uh, state organization, meaning in Ukrainian case, it's president himself, first of all. Mm -hmm. Verkhovna Rada, incorporated at least by majority, it's precondition to minimize the oligarchic uh, impact, definitely. Investors pool, which includes both international financial organizations, but also private investment uh, uh, channels and vehicles, all kind of. There, there is a range of. Uh, 
and of course direct access and collaboration between them. And this is the recipe precondition. And then there is a recipe itself which is coming in forms of all kind of uh, keys, so-called. But the, the, it should be there. And the elements are already there. But are they coordinated, already working in the proper way? I'm not sure yet. Yeah, okay. It's very difficult to say, obviously. I wanted, Mar uh, Marina, you have been so silent, and I wanted to actually ask you, everybody is talking about uh, integrating Ukraine into EU and all these processes. And uh, how, you, how do you see that, maybe also from the micro perspective, that, you know, all these uh, local governments, towns, uh, municipalities, also the uh, civic organizations. So how do you see this wider integration of, of Ukraine into Europe, be, being living in Vienna now and Estonia? So you must have a very good picture. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so here comes probably a bit of, you know, my past knowledge of Ukraine as, uh, you know, as a person who was born there and lived there for, for some years in the past. Uh, so Ukraine, I would say first, is a very um, heterogeneous country. So this is the problem that, I mean, it's, it's a, you know, it's a kind of, it's an asset on the one side, but on the other side, it's obviously a bit of a problem because uh, even before the war, Ukraine was, um, it was a very big spectrum of opinions and positions towards European Union, towards NATO. Um, ever since Ukraine existed as an independent, or like started to rig again, re existing as an independent country. And in that respect, uh, one point makes it now even harder, and this is something we haven't really uh, talked about, is what happens with the, with the territories which are currently occupied. Mm -hmm. So if Ukraine, uh, if they're hopefully liberated, uh, what is, what are their, I mean, from the reconstruction perspective, it's clear that they have to be rebuilt, probably not in the sh same shape as they were before, because the industry as it existed in Ukraine in the eastern part of the country is now outdated, so it doesn't make sense to rebuild it in, in the same shape. It has to be uh, modernized and has to, obviously new technologies have to be brought there. But the other side is about people who live there, and there, I, um, unfortunately, I have a grain of doubt about the opinions of people. I mean, I do tend to, uh, thinking optimistically, and thinking optimistically about the future of Ukraine, I want to think that people would have the same uh, opinion towards EU, uh, EU integration, for instance, that people will be united on that. There will be a strong nation, uh, Ukraine, one single strong nation with one strong, uh, you know, um, view towards the European Union. But I, c unfortunately, I cannot be 100% confident on that because people are uh, still, uh, there are different opinions. And even after the war, even after this horrible tragedy happened, there still could be some people who may oppose that. Mm -hmm. um, although, you know, I, I, I'm, still st I'm still hoping to to be optimistic on that, and uh, I really see a bright uh, future of Ukraine and the European Union, uh, personally also, but also thinking as, as an economist, I do see uh, Ukraine and Ukrainian great potential for the European Union because it will be a great, um, it, will be a, it will be a strong country and it will be a benefit not only for Ukraine, but also for the European Union to have Ukraine as a full-scale uh, member with the same rights and with the same uh, opportunities because Ukraine is a very rich country in terms of not only resources, we usually think about resources, but also in terms of the human capitalists. Mm -hmm. uh, Yannick also outlined people are very skillful, people are very smart, and the education system is very strong. Uh, and I do hope that Ukraine, Ukrainian people will have the same strong national identity also after the war, because now as with the military escalation, it was obviously one of the strong points that Ukraine have this very strong national, uh, mm -hmm. national feeling, even like even for me, I haven't been living in Ukraine now in decades, but I, I, do, I, I still now start uh, all of a sudden again identifying myself very strongly as Ukrainian, and I do have this um, individual, like this um, national identity. So I hope that it will also stay there after the war. Uh, again, assumption on the war will be obviously victorious for Ukraine. And I hope that it will be also for all Ukrainians, in the sense that there will be this strong unity, as it was for, U for Estonian society after, uh, after the end of the Soviet occupation. So this is something what uh, has to be there, as it, it is one of the crucial aspects for the EU integration, in my perspective. Mm -hmm. Janika wanted to comment and then drive. Yes, unfortunately, I have to run because I'm working on rebuilding Ukraine. <laughs> I'm partially joking, but not only because one of the projects I'm working on right now is actually Expo 2030. Because Ukraine, Odessa, wants to be a host city of uh, Expo 2030 because it sees it's, it as a huge opportunity to basically boost the economy and the tourism and the infrastructure and so on. So this is kind of, I have one meeting coming. But um, I'm absolutely sure the majority of Ukrainians support EU, support NATO. 
it's even in constitution there is no doubt as of course there is like uh, people imagine this kind of words eu in different ways of course they do of course they weigh different uh, things from this uh, eu or nato they have different ex expectations but i'm absolutely sure that the huge majority of ukrainians are basically for the same values and for the eu whatever it means thank you <laughs> Okay, thank you, Anika, very much. Thank you for coming, and uh, <laughs> it's okay. But uh, Raiva wanted My comment to comment. Actually, it was yeah. partly already covered, but it was about resources. Ukraine <laughs> is extremely rich in both ways, in human resources and natural resources. And just uh, some calculations have been made uh, for the region which is now major, under major attack or uh, is attacked because of the war. Or, uh, and this war zone itself is including about trillion of, of different kind of natural resources already. Yeah. So basically, it is a self-sufficient project in Ukrainian case, if it will be utilized properly. And among those resources are those which are in great need for Europe to follow the path of the grain turn, to follow for the energy independence from autocratic regimes and so on. So Ukraine can pa pa provide at least part of the solution already. Just it should be taken into account and uh, utilize in the best possible way. Yeah. So I'm very happy that you made this comment because I was, uh, we have a couple of minutes left and I was planning from the beginning to end with a very uh, positive note. So, and um, if you look at the title of our panel, then there is a word innovation and we haven't used it. So now I ask you very shortly because we each of you have one minute. Uh, maybe, you know, if, if you really try to end with a positive note and think the future, what kind of innovations do you see as crucial and what, what innovations do you propose? Can be technological, can be also organizational, uh, coordination-wise, can be also, uh, of course, economics, uh, different uh, business models that are also political. So uh, I let you to think a bit, and who wants to start? Rainer, please. I will make it very short. <clears throat> I, I recommend for um, European or global politicians just only one innovation thing. Everything should be done in the right time, in a correct way. And not just to wait something or that something is improving itself or it's something is just passing you, not touching you. So it's, it's time to act. And it's, if, you, if, you like, if you like to see that Europe will survive and stay the same as it at the moment and develop in the future, we should help the Ukraine out of this mess. That's it. Okay. Peter. Well, uh, Ukraine resembles uh, Estonia in 1990s. We did many crazy things. And uh, <laughs> I think at uh, so some point of time it seemed to be that uh, nobody was responsible even. But somehow it ended up well. And obviously, even if we made mistakes, uh, the uh, the risk of doing nothing is always much more significant, and uh, first uh, results will come if you, if you just wait inst uh, instead of making decisions. And even if they are wrong, you can redo it. Uh, and and that's why I think uh, Estonia is becoming like an old uh, gentleman in late 40s, uh, already quite careful. Perhaps all those cushions and pension funds available, Ukraine, <laughs> in, including the stomach, which is uh, authority. But uh, <laughs> but uh, basically, Ukraine is still uh, kind of young and it's very easy to see sometimes um, this guy in 40s it looks w with some kind of envy even mm -hmm. those young people how can they do things which we in our childhood childhood or in young years did and bachelor years and, and now it's perhaps sometimes easy to, to, to sometimes to give some advice which sometimes can be even useful you know okay thank you but advice is never that be careful and do nothing that's <laughs> that's uh, absolutely no go okay thank you marine um so also you know speaking combining to ukraine and innovation so again maybe yeah this is related to the fact that ukraine is like now young and it has a good pot potential to to grow in a sense there is also a good space to to test the innovations and in that respect i think i would uh, Something I would be, um, ha I would have an emphasis on is on the, the green innovations concerning especially the energy sector, because yeah. this is something we touched a bit on the energy crisis, a huge energy crisis. And now with uh, p potentially like a lot of uh, critical infrastructure being already destroyed and or being heavily damaged, and that could persist in the next month, we cannot rule it out. Um, I would th say that post-war Ukraine would be an excellent space to innovate, to, to test, to, to implement and test the new green technologies uh, when it comes to the energy sector. And uh, yeah, so this would be um, a win-win for, uh, for Ukraine and for the EU and the global economy. 
Absolutely, I agree. And Raiwa? Yeah, at the very moment when President Zelensky mentioned that actually Ukraine can provide Europe with energy, right at the very moment after that, Russians started to bomb out everything, <laughs> which is related to the infrastructure for that purpose. But, but it's not accidental, by the way. It's deliberate choice uh, and understandable one. But my point was actually very simple. The, 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 the importance of the mindset is a very important thing. Yeah, energet, uh, energizing the society and keeping the innovative and readiness mindset, readiness for changes, is very important. At a certain point of time, when you reach a certain level of development, you start to, to lose this momentum. So don't, Ukrainians, please, don't lose the momentum. <laughs> At the moment, the war has actually speeded up and beefed up, in a sense, the whole momentum for this l way of thinking, mindset. So major innovation is not technology related or organizations related, mm -hmm. it's to the mindset related. And that's my message. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, all of you. Uh, it was a pleasure. And the opponents of Ukrainian development maybe are blaming Ukraine to, that they have waken up the whole West. And, uh, but what you have said is uh, uh, to Uk all Ukrainians, keep up the good job. And uh, I think with this optimistic note, we can go to a small break and we are basically back to in our schedule. So everything what happens next happens on time. So see you later. <laughs>